afternoon, we're going to be discussing Virgil's epic poem, The Aeneid. Uh, here is The Aeneid. And so our next uh, literary discussion will focus on Dante's Inferno. Uh, but to have a really good understanding, strong grasp of Dante's epic masterpiece, we must first study uh, Virgil's epic masterpiece. So I'm using the Robert Fitzgerald uh, translation uh, as well, as you can see. So before we even get started uh, discussing this monumental work of literature, I uh, just want to note that you see Virgil's words all the time. Uh, uh, this is a case in point. If you take out a dollar bill, the backside of a dollar bill, and you look at the phrase uh, here, novus ordo seclorum, novus ordo seclorum. It means new order of the ages, new order of the ages. And so, uh, by the way, make sure you wash your hands after uh, handling currency. So what was he predicting? Uh, a golden era for uh, Emperor Augustus, for the great Roman Emperor Augustus, who ruled during Virgil's time. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, Emperor Augustus did usher in a golden age. We'll talk uh, a lot more about that. Very successful uh, reign of his. Uh, but actually, um, he got this, he used this phrase Virgil. It comes from directly from the fourth eclogue from the fourth eclogue, uh, New Order of the Ages. And that's when he is, Virgil, celebrating the birth of a boy. Just whom he is speaking about, it wasn't clear until the Middle Ages. If you fast forward several centuries uh, to the Middle Ages, it was thought during that time, it was common thought that uh, he had prophesied, Virgil had prophesied the virgin birth. Uh, New Order of the Ages, this golden era being ushered in, uh, you know, by uh, the celebration of a birth of, of a baby boy. And so Virgil then was seen as having these sort of uh, prophetic powers that he had been able to announce basically the coming of the Messiah uh, and to anticipate the teachings of Jesus Christ. So it's no wonder then uh, in Dante's Inferno, uh, Dante has his favorite author Virgil, uh, you know, as his guide uh, when he goes to the depths uh, of hell, uh, to the uh, lowest depths of hell. It has to be, in other words, a pagan figure, uh, you know, uh, who is uh, Virgil, Virgil being born in 70 BC and passed away at quite a young age in 19 BC, uh, passed away at the age of 51. Uh, anyhow, if we could go back uh, for a minute here, by the way, it's not just, uh, you know, on our dollar bill, this phrase, new order of the ages, it's also on our glorious nation's great seal uh, as well. So um, interesting how Virgil evolved as a sort of wizard as this sort of, you know, uh, individual with prophetic powers. Uh, he actually was also regarded as an astrologer as well. There's such interesting anecdotes uh, with regard to uh, Virgil. For instance, uh, there was this swamp in his beloved Naples. There was a swamp and there was a problem with gnats and gadflies. And so what does Virgil do? He decided to create this uh, huge copper uh, figure uh, of a, of a fly. Uh, and so he posted it on a wall by the neighboring swamp where the problem was. Well, immediately no more gnats or gadflies. Uh, there's another interesting anecdote uh, about him, Virgil, having made this huge bronze statue uh, of a horse. Uh, and so anyone who had a horse that had physical pain or affliction, if uh, the horse was uh, taken three times around Virgil's bronze statue, they were just cured of their pains uh, or their physical afflictions. So um, one another interesting one uh, I recall is actually one of my favorites is Virgil had uh, carved two marble heads uh, at a gate uh, in Naples. Uh, one of the marble heads was a weeping face. Another was a laughing face. And so anyone who came uh, inadvertently uh, unable to see exactly directly in front of them, but anyone, a guest who came through the gate with the weeping uh, face, weeping marble face, either uh, their work never came to fruition, their project, 
or uh, their business it was dispatched but it took a lot of trouble uh, you know a lot of labor uh, any lucky guest who went through the gate with a laughing face while their business was immediately and successfully dispatched so uh, lots of interesting uh, anecdotes uh, with regard uh, with regard uh, to Virgil so uh, anyhow moving on here uh, so as the story goes then um, when we first begin uh, the Aeneid uh, actually the hero, uh, the protagonist is Aeneas, Trojan born Aeneas. And so uh, really, uh, who is Aeneas? He was a minor character in Homer's Iliad. So if you read uh, in book 20, book 20 of the Iliad, uh, Poseidon, uh, the god Poseidon saves the Trojan Aeneas from Achilles. And so this episode uh, is taken by Virgil and, you know, look at what he does with it. He creates this epic hero, uh, Virgil does, out of uh, the Trojan Aeneas. So, and I feel like, you know, with the fall of Troy, Virgil is showing us that even though uh, you know, Troy is going to fall and be devastated. Uh, the, even though we witness the utter destruction of Troy, something Trojan will survive, and that is the Trojan captain Aeneas and his squadron, uh, who are trying to find the promised land now, which is going to be uh, Italy, actually. So uh, Poseidon actually had prophesied that Aeneas would survive the sack of Troy and find a new city elsewhere. This is according uh, to Homer's uh, Iliad. So it's a vague prophecy. That's all Poseidon had said. But look again at what Virgil has done. Uh, Virgil has done with this uh, myth. And so uh, anyhow, moving on, uh, I guess we can get right uh, we can get right to our reading uh, here, right to the reading. And so uh, I'm just, uh, you know, going through uh, very quickly, summarizing uh, briefly uh, my written lectures, my written lectures. And so, by the way, please keep in mind that we have a reference guide. Uh, I've also posted a very helpful reference guide. It's got the gods, goddesses, uh, major figures uh, from this epic poem uh, as well. So... Uh, anyhow, moving uh, moving along, and so uh, as we, uh, I'm looking through uh, Aeneid Lecture 1B, uh, Lecture 1B, as soon as we start off this epic literary work, I mean, really, this is the only uh, time I recall uh, where we begin a literary work with the hero wishing he had died from the very beginning of this poem. And so, uh, as I have in my notes, he's quite a, a quote unquote melancholy uh, hero uh, as we have it here. And so he is being buffeted by this terrible storm that Juno has caused. The goddess Juno uh, in the Aeneid is really uh, Homer's goddess Hera. Uh, she is queen of the gods. And you're gonna notice, and I have this in my uh, reference guide for the Aeneid, uh, the, there's similar gods uh, and goddesses uh, with uh, Homer's divinities, but the names are different. And of course, you know, th there's been this issue, well, my gosh, Virgil copied, uh, you know, these Olympian uh, deities and, and divinities of Homer's. Uh, but of course, I mean, you can't, uh, of course, you have a god of the sea, you have uh, a goddess of warfare, god of war, uh, you know, a king of the gods, queen of the gods, that can't change, right? So uh, he merely uh, has different names uh, for these uh, for these figures. So anyhow, it's been as, as soon as we start this epic poem, it's been uh, seven years uh, since the fall of Troy, and um, Aeneas is yearning for a new home. You know, there's a, a lot of longing in this poem, longing for a new homeland a country, a home, longing uh, for love, as we're going to see with Queen Dido. Uh, there's a great love story uh, here, and that's uh, in my next lecture, and that's in book four uh, of the Aeneid. And Virgil actually, um, he modeled book four, the, the love tragedy, uh, based on Greek tragedy. So, uh, and I have some essay outlines uh, about that uh, as well. So anyhow, he's escaped Aeneas, uh, you know, Troy. He's been uh, just looking for a home for seven year, years now. And so the goddess Juno, she was really upset. Uh, again, think about Queen Hera, uh, you know, queen of the go goddesses, gods and goddesses. Uh, queen Hera and that 
that uh, wretched Olympian beauty contest uh, in the Iliad. So she still uh, has a sort of hostility and resentment uh, towards the Trojans. And so now as Queen Juno, a queen of the gods Juno, she wants to obstruct uh, Trojan Aeneas's path. Uh, and so uh, anyhow, j just this goddess has so much ire and hate uh, and just so much destruction aimed at poor Aeneas. You can't help but feel sorry for him and his devastated Trojan fleet as they're approaching uh, Italy here. The depth of her hatred for the Trojans is immense. Uh, anyhow, uh, and so she has a sort of avenging rage. She's held this grudge because of that awful beauty contest, believe it or not. So uh, Aeneas is the object of her hostility. She's full of wrath, Juno. And so she feels that her sense of honor has been injured. She feels defeated. She feels a loss of prestige. She laments uh, the goddess Juno that she is less powerful than the goddess of warfare, Athena. Uh, look at what she's saying here. I'm looking in book one, line 53. She's saying uh, to herself, the goddess Juno, give up what I began. Am I defeated? Am I impotent to keep the king of two strands from Italy? The fates forbid me, am I to suppose? She goes on, I who walk as queen of all the gods, sister and wife of Jove, I must contend for years against one people. Who adores the power of Juno after this or lays an offering with prayer upon her altar? So uh, anyhow, she's feeling the sort of uh, resentment. She feels like she's been belittled, dishonored. And so uh, not only does she uh, hold a grudge against the Trojans, um, but uh, she, she values her role as queen of all the gods and goddesses. Uh, and so uh, she's just lamenting that she's not being respected uh, as a divine being, that perhaps she has a sort of waning power. Uh, anyhow, so what does she do now to obstruct poor Aeneas and his Trojan fleet? The mother of the gods, Juno, is seeking the aid of the wind god, Aeolus. Uh, she's asking him to unleash these raging winds to create this great storm off of Sicily that's going to cause all this turmoil, and it's uh, going to cause Aeneas to be stranded. So look at what she says. Oh my gosh, she's so scary. Uh, book one, line 73, uh, Juno. The race I hate is crossing the Tuscan Sea, transporting Ilium with her household gods, beaten as they are to Italy. Put new fury into your winds and make the long ships founder, drive them off course, throw bodies into the sea. Oh my goodness gracious. Very ruthless, very uh, fearful uh, divinity uh, Juno is. So even though Aeneas is sailing towards a new world, he should be happy. He should feel optimism. Uh, but he's not. He's thinking about the past. He's wishing he had perished at Troy. Uh, and so, again, as I mentioned, he's the only epic hero whom I can recall who enters a poem wishing he was no longer alive. Uh, look at what he says, book one, line 123. Triple lucky all all you men to whom death came before your father's eyes but below the wall at Troy. Bravest Danaean, Diomedes, why could I not go down when you had wounded me and lose my life on Ilium's battlefield? Our Hector lies there, torn by Achilles' weapon. There Sarpedon, our giant father, lies. So uh, anyhow, he is lost in his melancholy. Uh, and so now he does have an ally, uh, Aeneas, in uh, the form of Neptune, god of the sea. Uh, Neptune is going to save the Trojan captain's uh, surviving seafaring crew uh, and is going to be supporting the displaced Trojans um, in fulfilling their fate. Uh, and so anyhow, uh, Neptune, uh, even though his sister uh, is Juno, uh, he is always against, uh, you know, uh, Juno's um, uh, terrible machinations. And so uh, anyhow, moving on, we, we have another instance here when um, this is going to be in book five, when Aeneas's mother uh, Venus uh, comes crying uh, to, to Neptune, god of the sea, for aid for his uh, help in helping her son. And so, uh, of course, uh, Neptune is going to side with uh, Venus uh, and go against his sister uh, Juno. So uh, I have this all in detail uh, in my written lecture, uh, in my written lecture. So uh, moving on here, moving on, 
Neptune rejects any sort of uh, alliance with his ruthless sister Juno. Of course, he's going to join the goddess of love and sensuality uh, on the side uh, of Aeneas. And so, so now, you know, uh, however way you feel about Aeneas, I feel like he's showing himself to be a good leader. Even though this man wishes he was no longer living, look at what he tells now his crew. He wants to be a source of optimism for them. He doesn't want them to lose any sort of hope. He, he's this sort of uh, gale-worn uh, commander, uh, but he's trying to be heroic here. He's providing wine and food for his men. He's trying to soothe their grieving hearts, their distress. Um, he's showing concern for others, Aeneas. He's showing perseverance. Uh, he's grief-stricken, but he's trying to reassure his fleet. He's encouraging them uh, here. Uh, take a look at what he's telling his crew, Aeneas. Someday, perhaps, remembering even this will be a pleasure. Through diversities of luck and through so many challenges, we hold our course for Latium, where the fates hold out a settlement and rest for us. Troy's kingdom there shall rise again. Be patient. Save yourselves for more auspicious days. So ran the speech. Burdened and sick at heart, he, Aeneas, feigned hope in his look and inwardly contained his anguish. So even though he's going into the unknown with his men, um, he he's really trying in a sincere way to encourage his storm-wracked companions here after they land in Carthage uh, off the coast of Africa. Uh, and so he's reassuring them that better times uh, are ahead. So I feel like he's a good-hearted man here. Um, we we constantly see Aeneas's sense of duty, sense of duty to his people, to his crew, to his little boy, as we'll see later, his sense of duty, of course, to the gods. Aeneas uh, is going to be on this divinely ordained mission to be the founder of Rome. And so, you know, after you all uh, have been reading the uh, Iliad and you have this sort of individualistic hero like Achilles who's fighting for his ego and uh, personal glory and triumph, uh, now you have this quote-unquote dutiful uh, hero, uh, Aeneas, uh, here. And so, you know, his personal destiny is to be uh, finding a new settlement in Italy, the foundation of Rome. It's this holy obligation. It's been ordained by the gods. So yes, he's not really, uh, he, he lacks a sort of exciting personality, of course. You know, he, I feel like Aeneas is a puppet of the gods many times throughout this epic poem. This is a famous quote, book one, line 519. I am Aeneas, duty-bound and known above high air of heaven by my fame, carrying with me in my ships our gods of hearth and home, safe from the enemy. I look for Italy to be my fatherland, and my descent is from the all-highest Jove. So uh, really, that's just the god uh, Jupiter, another term for the god Jupiter, uh, really Zeus, Homer Zeus. Uh, basically. So uh, anyhow, he has dedicated his entire life, Aeneas, to Roman history, uh, to the future of Rome. And so it's extreme self-sacrifice on Aeneas's part. But again, he's not this sort of self-indulgent uh, character. Uh, he has a sense of duty. And so, yeah, you're not going to get a well-rounded character uh, with, with Aeneas. So uh, anyhow, uh, moving on. Uh, in the meantime, uh, his mother Venus, uh, she has quote-unquote tears in her shining eyes. She's very frustrated that her son Aeneas is stranded far away from the promised land. Uh, and so Venus is appealing to the father of gods and men, Jupiter. Uh, he's uh, reminding uh, Jupiter of her son's death. Destiny. She's wondering what's happened. Uh, and so uh, finally, uh, the mighty uh, ruler of Olympus, Jupiter, he kisses his daughter Venus. He tells her, uh, you know, quote unquote, no need to be afraid. Your children's destiny has not been changed. As promised, you shall see Lavinian's walls uh, and take up then amid the stars of heaven Great souled Aeneas, in Italy he will fight a massive war, beat down fierce armies, then for the people there establish city walls and a way of life. So uh, he, it's going to go uh, as 
as had as has been faded uh, this sort of divine ordinance uh, from the gods for Aeneas uh, to go on this sort of mission. So uh, anyhow, even though the fiery goddess Juno is constantly, uh, you know, in uh, poor Aeneas's way, trying to obstruct his rightful path, trying to throw Aeneas off his fated mission, uh, Jupiter, uh, the king of high Olympus, is going to always prevail over Juno's constant uh, interference. Next we have, uh, and I have it in my lecture notes, beautiful, gracious, hospitable Queen Dido. So uh, now uh, we're, we're going to get the love story uh, pretty soon here. Uh, and so uh, when we first see Queen Dido, her entrance is one of bustling activity. There's a sort of ferment of uh, activity productivity. Uh, and so uh, take a look here, quote unquote, so Dido seemed in such delight, she moved amid her people cheering on the toil of a kingdom uh, in the making. So a comparison is made between uh, the Carthaginians, Dido, queen of the Carthaginians, uh, as uh, they're, they're likened to these sort of productive bees in this happy ferment of activity, uh, whereas, uh, you know, the Trojan refugees, Aeneas's crew, they're later likened to these small trudging insects. So this is all going to change. When we first see Queen Dido, my gosh, this majestic queen, there's this empire of hers that's flourishing. There's so much hope. There's so much promise. Uh, but then, unfortunately, that's going to all change. There's going to be a fatal reversal. Uh, you know, that's going to be Aeneas later when he has this sort of renewed hope and energy to go uh, back uh, on his divinely ordained mission. Now, though, we see Dido extremely happy, just the opposite with uh, Aeneas. Take a look. Um, Aeneas, I, I mean, I have it. I don't mean to be mean, but sometimes, you know, in my uh, lecture notes, I have the passive hero, uh, the characterless hero, Aeneas. Uh, he ends up going uh, into Juno's temple. Ironically, Juno's temple. Juno is the, his sort of enemy, uh, the goddess Juno. But he goes into Juno's temple uh, in Carthage. He's just astonished when he sees these decorated panels and they're depicting the Trojan War. And so uh, take a look. He feels very calmed when he sees this. Quote, unquote, here for the first time he took heart to hope for safety and to trust his destiny more even in affliction. Uh, he sees uh, Priam, Achilles, uh, fierce in his rage at both sides. Here Aeneas halted and tears came. So, you know, Virgil is taking us back through these Iliadic characters that we are already so invested in. And here we see Aeneas, uh, he's just... We see his humanity because he's showing so much depth of emotion, seeing these decorated panels uh, and these figures here, uh, you know, from the Trojan War. It's just conjuring up more memories for him. He already, uh, you know, when we began the poem, he was already in this melancholy state. Well, now he's just even more so because this is bringing back these sad memories of Troy when he sees these panels uh, in Juno's temple. Uh, and so Aeneas is weeping uh, at the temple doors when he sees these uh, pictures that are sympathetically portraying the events of the Trojan War, of Trojan suffering. Uh, and so he's just, you know, moved profoundly uh, when he sees this, this extraordinary artwork. So uh, while he's mournfully gazing at these panels, uh, the queen, Queen Dido, she's quote unquote, the queen paced uh, toward the temple in her beauty, Dido with a throng of men behind her. That's book one, line 676. So uh, they're just the opposite, uh, you know, now. Uh, in terms of their emotional states, and then wait until we see, uh, you know, at the end, um, at the end of book four, uh, what happens. It's a, it's a reversal. Uh, and so now great soul Aeneas is recognizing Dido's generous uh, humanity. And so um, anyhow, at this point, uh, in the meantime, so he's by himself. In the meantime, his seafaring crew has landed separately. And so they're bursting into Queen Dido's palace. The Trojans are asking uh, the gracious Queen Dido for refuge for their fleet since they have not been gi given permission to touch land. So basically, these are Trojan refugees. Uh, and so uh, Queen Dido is just so gracious. Uh, she has empathy 
for these shipwrecked wanderers. She's willing to uh, help them. She's willing to help these refugees before she even meets their commander, Aeneas. She's giving them a hospitable welcome. So this is the first female character so far this semester whom I not only respect, but whom I like a lot as well. Uh, take a look here, book one, line 762. Queen Dido is telling the Trojan refugees, cast off your fear, you Teucrians. Put anxiety aside. I shall dispatch you safely with an escort provisioned from my stores. Or would you care to join us in this realm on equal terms? The city I build is yours. Haul up your ships. Trojan and Tyrian will be one to me. If only he were here, your king himself, caught by the same easterly. Aeneas, indeed, let me send out trustworthy men along the coast with orders to comb it all from one end of Libya to the other in case uh, the sea cast the man up and now he wanders lost uh, in town or wilderness. So very caring, uh, kind uh, woman and ruler. Uh, she's saying you're going to be on equal terms with us, with us Carthaginians uh, here. And this can be home uh, to you as well. So before now, before there's going to be this fateful meeting between Aeneas and Dido, what does Aeneas's mother uh, do? Uh, the crafty uh, goddess Venus, she's going to beautify her son so that Dido will fall in love with him instantly. Uh, and so uh, anyhow, you know, she is the goddess of a erotic desire, of course. And so what happens is uh, she has a sort of cloud around um, around Aeneas, but the first time Dido sees him, it's like this cloud is dissipated and gone. And so take a look, book one, line 797, princely Aeneas stood and shone in the bright light, head and shoulders, noble as a god's, for she who bore him Venus breathed upon him beauty of air and bloom of youth and kindled brilliance in his eyes as an artist's hand uh, gives style to ivory. So uh, the Trojan prince Aeneas is making this dramatic appearance. Oh my gosh, Dido, she's just, uh, she's awestruck here. Uh, quote unquote, the glowing Dido uh, is uh, amazed at this sight. Sidonian Dido stood in astonishment, first at the sight of such a captain, then at his misfortune. You know, Dido can relate to Aeneas's misfortune. Look at what she says, book one, line 857. She says, my life was one of hardship and forced wandering like your own, till in this land at length fortune would have me rest. Through pain I've learned to comfort suffering men. So uh, in the meantime, the goddess Venus, so crafty, so mischievous. Venus wants to get Dido on Aeneas's side. After all, her, her son and his crew are shipwrecked, uh, you know, in Dido's kingdom. And so Venus is going to conquer Dido uh, by passion. Uh, it's almost as if she's putting a spell, this love spell, uh, on poor Dido. And so I call her the troublesome goddess, Venus, the troublesome goddess of passionate love. She's going to allow Venus, Dido's passion, to just, uh, you know, uh, destroy her, basically. Uh, it's going to become fatal, actually. And so she knows, Venus, that her son is going to be, uh, you know, setting up uh, a foundation in Rome. She knows uh, what's going to happen anyway, that ultimately Aeneas will have to leave Carthage, Dido's Carthage, for his destined Rome. So uh, I have it in my lecture notes. Note the parallels with, uh, you know, Aphrodite's influence on Helen in Homer's Iliad. Uh, remember the beauty contest uh, and Aphrodite uh, leading the Trojan Paris uh, to Helen. Uh, also uh, recall uh, Aphrodite in Euri Euripides' Medea, casting that sort of spell on Medea where Medea is just going above and beyond uh, to help Jason because she falls uh, devastatingly in love uh, with, with Jason. Uh, moving on uh, now. So um, I'm going to skip around a bit. Uh, she has all kinds of schemes. Uh, Venus does, my goodness. Uh, she's summoning Cupid now. Venus is asking Cupid to set Dido's heart on fire with love. She's a very clever goddess. She's instructing Cupid to be disguised as her grandson, Aeneas' son, Escaneus. Uh, and so look at what she tells uh, Cupid, uh, Venus. 
Uh, this is book one, line 896. What I propose is to ensnare the queen by guile beforehand, pin her down in passion so she cannot be changed by any power, but will be kept on my side by profound love of Aeneas. You counterfeit his figure, Escanaeus, Aeneas' son, for one night, no more, and make the boy's known face your mask, so that when Dido takes you on her lap amid the banqueting and wine, enjoy when she embraces you uh, and kisses you, you'll breathe invisible fire into her and dupe her with your sorcery. Um, Cupid agreed with his fond mother's plan of action, put off his wings, and gaily walked as Escanaeus or Iulus. Venus, in turn, uh, sent through Escanaeus's body rills of slumber. So, I mean, imagine this. Aeneas's little boy, uh, first he goes to, uh, you know, uh, grasp his father around the neck, Aeneas. Then he goes uh, to Queen Dido, uh, and he's sitting on Dido's lap. But it's not Aeneas' son. It's really uh, Cupid. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Didus, in other words, when she's embracing uh, this little boy, um, she's, she's embracing Cupid. And so, um, you know, she's going to be, I guess, having the fatal arrow uh, of love, shot with the pharaoh adal, uh, arrow of love. Uh, anyhow. Uh, moving on, moving on. Take a look. Uh, this is interesting. Book one, line 971. Dido, she with all her eyes and heart embraced him, Cupid, oblivious at how great a god sat there uh, to her undoing, mindful of his mother, Venus. He had begun to make Sychaeus, Dido's husband, deceased husband, to make Sychaeus fade from Dido's memory bit by bit and try to waken with new love, a living love her long settled mind and dominant heart. So uh, anyhow, when Dido places Aeneas' son on her lap uh, and she embraces him unknowingly, uh, she's embracing the god of passionate desire uh, who's filling her with intense and uncontrollable longing that just completely erases the memory uh, of her dead husband. In the meantime, there's a banquet, there's a festive uh, royal banquet that Dido has in honor of the Trojan captain Aeneas and his crew and his squadron. It's in her palace hall. Uh, by the end of this banquet, by the end of the evening, uh, besides the wine, Dido has drunk, quote unquote, long draughts of love. So uh, anyhow, now, next we're on book two, book two, and this is all about the Trojan horse and the fall of Troy. This is really fascinating. And uh, I have uh, the subtitle, Don't Look a Gift Horse in the Mouth. Uh, so, uh, so now Dido is holding uh, this royal banquet uh, in Aeneas's honor. She is so sympathetic to Aeneas, she's asking him to recount the story of the fall of Troy. And that's how we, the reader, uh, are going to hear this story and uh, learn about what the actual events were of the fall of Troy. Uh, and every time he's speaking, the more and more Aeneas speaks, uh, the more and more Dido becomes sympathetic. Uh, to him and his plight and all that he has endured. Remember, it's almost like Venus has cast a spell uh, on poor Dido. So, uh, so now he's asked Aeneas to recount his story. He says, book two, line three, sorrow too deep to tell your majesty. You order me to feel and tell once more how the Danaeans, the Greeks, leveled in the dust the splendor of our mourned forever kingdom heartbreaking things I saw with my own eyes and was myself a part of. Uh, but he still is going to recount the story to her just as she has asked. So he's going back now seven years, uh, Aeneas, uh, in recounting uh, this history here. Uh, and so as he continues his story, Dido is simultaneously propelled to her tragic uh, passion here. That famous painting I have, uh, you know, uh, by, by Pierre Narcisse Guerin, uh, that's, that's in my syllabus. Uh, that's, uh, you know, um, where I, I'm getting this, uh, this episode of Virgil's poem from, and it's also in this written lecture. Uh, I've uh, embedded this uh, famous painting, a, a photo of this famous painting. So uh, anyhow, uh, first we find out through Aeneas that the Trojans were deceived by the treacherous lying Greeks. You know, keep in mind that um, Virgil detests 
the Greeks. Uh, he, uh, you know, is in the Trojan camp. And so he's always uh, showing the Greeks to be just really malicious uh, and lying and deceitful. And so anyhow, uh, moving uh, on here, moving on. So we find out that the Greeks had built this huge horse of timber. Uh, there was Greek warriors inside. Uh, and so it just gained entry into Troy. These Trojans are so innocent when they see this huge monstrosity of a horse, wooden horse. They have no idea that there's uh, individuals in there, Greek fighters, soldiers uh, in there. And so the Trojan horse then is a symbol of Greek dis dishonesty. When the Trojans uh, first come across this huge wooden horse, they don't know what to do with it. Uh, they're presuming that the Greeks had just retreated and they left this here. Uh, and so the Trojan piece, Laokoon, the Trojan priest, uh, is telling them uh, that they shouldn't, the Trojans shouldn't be foolish. Uh, he's warning about the quote-unquote gift of the wooden horse that's left behind by the Greeks. This Trojan priest Laokoon is saying that, you know, this is dangerous. This might be something that's dangerous. Book 2, line 58, he says, Oh, my poor people, men of Troy, what madness has come over you? Can you believe the enemy truly gone? A gift from the Danaeans and no ruse? Uh, Achaeans must be hiding in this timber, or it was built to bed against our walls. He goes on, so he says, I fear them, gifts and all. He's afraid of the Greeks, rightfully so. Unfortunately, no one is listening to his uh, wise counsel here. Uh, and so the naive Trojans, they're just, they're doomed, really, uh, because uh, they think that they're going to be thinking that this is an offering uh, from a goddess and that they have to therefore accept this. Um, that's because there's a Greek infiltrator. Greek infiltrator, he, his name is Sinan, and so he is uh, coming to Troy as a captive. He has his hands tied behind his back, and so uh, he is just, you know, he's looking around fearlessly. This is just an act. Uh, this uh, Sinan, this figure of Sinan is supposed to come in the middle of the night when the Trojans are asleep and uh, open, uh, open uh, the panel, uh, a panel in the wooden horse and let out all these uh, fearful Greek soldiers. And that's how we get the devastating fall of Troy. So, but uh, Sinan is basically a Greek infiltrator. And so uh, he tells the naive Trojans, he says, look, uh, you know, if you take this wooden horse into your city, you're going to be safe. Troy will never fall. Uh, and so now the kindly King Priam uh, comes and he sees that there's shackles on Sinan's legs. He says, you know, remove the leg shackles. Uh, let them, let Sinan tell us, uh, you know, uh, his story. And so um, he, he has a sort of, tall tale, Sinan. He's lying to them, to the Trojans. He's provoking their tears, their pity. He says, you know, no hope is left for me. Uh, the Greeks don't trust me in my own home country. I'm never going to see my country again. Uh, you know, I'm not trusted here and, and so forth. So uh, Sinan is lamenting that both the Greeks, uh, his people, the Greeks, and then the Trojans, the enemies despise him. Uh, and so uh, he's, um, anyhow, he's saying that this immense wooden horse is a peace offering from the goddess Minerva. Minerva is a Roman counterpart of the Greek goddess Athena. So Sinan is such a liar. He is persuading the Trojans who believe him uh, uh, because they're so honest. Have you ever been uh, heard of a situation where, um, you know, someone is just so good and virtuous that their goodness and their virtue caused their downfall. That's what we have here, uh, unfortunately, uh, sadly, with the Trojans uh, here. Uh, take a look, book two, line 268. This fraud of Sinan, his accomplished line won us over. A tall tale and fake tears had captured us. Uh, so now these poor innocent uh, Trojans have been fooled into believing that this gigantic wooden horse, if taken into Troy, is going to bring them magic powers uh, over the Greeks. So uh, it's brought over, uh, you know, it's brought over through their gates. Uh, so next I have uh, in my lecture notes, fire, snakes, and treachery. Sinan tells the naive Trojans that 
if anybody violates or rejects the goddess Minerva's offering of the Trojan horse, death awaits that individual. So you have the theme of deception uh, in book two as it's practiced by the Greek Sinan, as it's epitomized by this huge wooden horse with its hidden armed Greek warriors inside. So, uh, and it's interesting, uh, I have it in my notes, I noticed this as well, is the language uh, that Virgil uses to describe the action of the Greeks and of Sinan, it's also used to describe these uh, ominous, uh, treacherous snakes that uh, end up killing the horse's challenger, Laokoon. Remember earlier, Laokoon had warned everybody uh, about the Trojan horse, uh, to be aware of the Greeks and their quote-unquote gift. Well, uh, we have snakes coming from uh, the goddess Minerva's uh, shrine uh, and just going and entangling and killing Laokoon uh, and his sons. It's very gruesome. Uh, it's in my notes. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, uh, mention it here quickly in passing. And so, uh, anyhow, uh, as the serpents are approaching uh, Laokoon, uh, they're likened to the Greek fleet uh, uh, of warriors. So a lot of parallels uh, in the language there. Uh, for example, both the snakes uh, and the wooden horse, quote unquote, craw crawled, uh, crawled towards the eventual demise of Troy. Anyhow, so in addition to serpent imagery in book two, Virgil skillfully employs fire imagery as well. Uh, and so these slithering serpent, serpents, snakes have quote unquote, burning eyes, fury and suffused with blood. Book two, line 288. So in the meantime, this is so sad. The naive Trojans, they're dancing, they're singing, they're so happy. They're pulling this uh, horse, huge horse into Troy. They're thinking that this is some sort of a religious festivity. Uh, they're not realizing that with their own hands that they're bringing destruction uh, upon themselves. Uh, anyhow, uh, very, very sad here. Uh, later on that fatal night of Troy, um, while all of Troy was asleep, um, unfortunately, quote unquote, buried deep in sleep, that's when Sinan, uh, he, he's there to uh, go and open the hatch of the wooden horse and out come all these Greek chieftains, including Ulysses, uh, including Achilles' son, Menelaus. They're all coming out from the wooden horse. They're going to be wreaking havoc and death and destruction uh, on the poor Trojans. And so uh, while he's sleeping, Aeneas has this dream uh, that Hector has come to him uh, and told him not to die for Troy, but to escape. And so Hector's voice says in this, in this sort of condescending tone, uh, Hector's uh, spirit says, you know what, if Troy could have been saved, I, with my own hands, could have saved it. It's not for you, Aeneas, uh, to, to do that. And so, you know, in other words, you must move on. You must not stand there defending Troy. That's going to be fruitless. So when uh, Aeneas wakens, uh, when he awakens, he realizes this uh, imminent Trojan disaster. He sees from his rooftop the fire and flames raging through the crops below. There's screams of people who are dying. Uh, and so... Aeneas loses his head uh, and he forgets his duty. His duty is to run away, to yield to a greater purpose of being the founder of Rome. Uh, but actually, uh, what does he do? He has a sort of internal fire. Remember fire imagery? Internal fire, and that's reflective of his tumultuous state of mind. Book 2, line 421. To arm was my first maddened impulse. Not that anyone had a fighting chance in arms. Only I burned to gather up some force for combat and to man some high redoubt. So fury drove me and it came to me that meeting death was beautiful in arms. So that sort of inner fire uh, that we see of this Trojan captain, uh, it's linking him to his native Troy, which is now burning, unfortunately, in flames. Uh, and so it's interesting. I have it in my notes. Virgil's heroic code uh, is based on um, not on self-assertion, but just uh, basically on commitment, on service, on duty. So Aeneas's first impulse when he sees that Troy is on fire is just to take arms and to go suicidal, suicidally into the battle uh, there. But he has to be told again and again 
you know, first it was by the ghost of Hector, uh, then it, it's by uh, Panthus, uh, then it's by his mother, Venus, then it's Creusa's ghost telling Aeneas he should not fight a hopeless battle. It's not fated that Troy will be victorious, uh, and so um, he should follow. Uh, he should follow that fate. So uh, anyhow, several figures, as I mentioned, are dissuading him uh, from fighting Troy uh, because it's fated for a disaster. There's a Trojan priest of Apollo, Panthus. Uh, he's saying, uh, book two, line 435, the last day for Dardania has come, the hour, hour not to be fought off any longer. Trojans, we have been, Ilium has been, the glory of the two strands is no more. Uh, and so he goes on, the gods by whom this kingdom stood are gone, gone from the shrines and altars. You defend a city lost in flames. Uh, and so Aeneas acknowledges, when the gods are contrary, they stand by no one. Interesting, now Aeneas is likened to a snake. Uh, snake symbolizing violence, deceit. Uh, he's betrayed by his own deceit because what does Aeneas do? He and his comrades disguise themselves in the armor uh, of the Greeks that they have killed. Uh, and so then their Greek vests and helmets, their war gear, ends up drawing friendly fire from the Trojans. Uh, anyhow, moving on. This next scene, oh my gosh, we have Achilles' son. So uh, if you found some admirable qualities about Homer's Achilles, you won't find a single one uh, in terms of his son, Pyrus, Achilles' son, Pyrus. Pyrus means flame covered. <coughs> <coughs> and Achilles' fearsome son does indeed have the sort of fiery spirit. But we have the worst of the father is reborn in the son uh, because Pyrus is likened to a serpent Pyrus is terrorizing poor King Priam. So uh, we have this scene. This is just devastating. I mean, you know which side Virgil is on, right? Uh, certainly he hates the Greeks. Uh, we see the figure of Pyrus, Achilles' son. Uh, here he is, um, you know, uh, coming uh, to kill, basically. Uh, he's on a mission to kill. He's with an axe. He's coming towards King Priam and Priam's family. There's a very poignant scene here where this elderly Trojan King Priam, he feebly tries to defend his home and people. But, uh, you know, his wife, Hecuba, tells him, uh, you know, you can, what, what mad thought is driving you to put on, uh, you know, your armor to fight? Uh, you know, this is not going to happen. You're going to die, uh, unfortunately. I have it in my notes. This scene here reminds me Pyrus with his axe uh, headed towards King Priam, headed towards Priam and Hecuba's son, one of their sons. It reminds me of Jack Nicholson's character in the movie The Shining. You know, there's a scene in that terrifying movie where there he is at the door with his axe. Uh, anyhow, so uh, the ferocious Pyrus is beginning his assault. He sees one of Priam's sons escape from him. Uh, and so now he comes, bur quote unquote, coming to Pyrus, burning for the death stroke. Uh, and so then after he's killed the boy, he wants to kill the boy's parents. Uh, oh my goodness gracious, there's all this uh, blood involved. Uh, anyhow, um, ill-starred, uh, quote-unquote ill-starred King Priam is speaking to Achilles' son. Uh, and so he's talking about Achilles' humanity and scruples, uh, which obviously this monster Pyrus does not possess. Take a look, King Priam, book two, line 696. For what you've done, for what you've dared, he, Priam, said, if there is a care in heaven for atrocity, may the gods render fitting thanks, reward you as you deserve. You force me to look on at the destruction of my son, defiled, a father's eyes with death. That great Achilles you claim to be the son of, and you lie, uh, was not like you to Priam, his enemy. To me, who threw myself upon his Achilles' mercy, he showed compunction gave me back for burial the bloodless corpse of Hector and returned me to my own realm. So now uh, the old man, uh, quote unquote, the old man Priam, he throws his spear. It's got a feeble impact. Uh, it just, it does nothing really. So he, he's just, he's harmless, uh, King Priam. There's nothing he can do. 
So just as the serpents had uh, strangled and killed Laokoon, the Trojan priest and his sons, this frightful Pyrrhus now is killing Priam's son first and then the father. So he grabs the feeble and elderly Priam by the hair. He's pulling the elderly man as, as Priam is trembling uh, and slipping in his own son's blood because moments ago Priam's son had just been slaughtered. Uh, and so he's just being dragged in his own son's blood. And really I feel like King Priam is a symbol for his doomed city here. Uh, anyhow, very, very sad. Very sad. Moving on. So uh, it's not until Aeneas sees King Priam dying that he's reminded Aeneas of his own father, wife, and child. So, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like Aeneas is a little slow, uh, you know, for him to realize something or, you know, um, yeah, a little slow. Uh, anyhow, uh, so now I have next in my notes, we have Helen. I put the vile Helen of Troy, and that's simply because that is how uh, the great Virgil uh, saw her, uh, how he perceived her. So um, he is afraid at this point, Aeneas, he suddenly notices a uh, Helen. Helen is hiding in a corner in terror. Uh, she's quote unquote lurking beyond the door sill and hiding silent. I feel like she's being likened also to a snake in terms of her concealment and destructive capability uh, there. And so, uh, well, a snake's destructive capability, uh, I suppose. So he is just full of anger, Aeneas. What does he want to do? He wants to quote unquote punish Helen's whorishness for all the trouble she has caused. He thinks for a second, why don't I kill her? Why don't I kill Helen? She is the culprit. She is what caused uh, all of this. Um, moving on here. So uh, let's see. Uh, what happens though is, um, what happens is Aeneas's mother uh, comes and stops him. Uh, this is under the category now in my lecture, as always, the gods are to blame. So Aeneas's divine mother suddenly appears in a quote unquote pure light. She's radiant. She's telling her son that if she had not looked out for Aeneas's wife and child, that they would have been killed. So she's warning uh, Aeneas, her son, to guard his home. Uh, and so she says uh, to Aeneas, don't blame Helen for all that's happening here. Don't blame Helen. Don't blame uh, Paris, they are not the cause of all this. Book 2, line 790. The harsh will of the gods it is, the gods that overthrow the splendor of this place and bring Troy from her height into the dust. Look over there, I'll tear away the cloud that curtains you and films your mortal sight, the fog around you. So, so she basically tells Aeneas, look, I'm going to tear away this cloud uh, so that you in your mortal sight can see what's really happening. Uh, what's happening in the background. And so Venus shows uh, Aeneas uh, basically that the gods themselves are overthrowing Troy. She is pointing out the truth uh, to Aeneas and he realizes he cannot fight against the gods when they're destroying Troy. So Venus is drawing uh, this dark cloud of mortal vision away from, Venus, from Aeneas's sight. Uh, he can see the Olympian gods are wrecking Troy. Uh, Neptune, the god Neptune is shaking the walls that he had helped to create. Uh, the goddess Juno is calling out for Greek forces. The goddess Minerva is vigorously shaking her armor while Jupiter is inciting the gods on. This is what's really happening. So anyhow, all of Troy is on fire now. Uh, and so the dutiful Aeneas, uh, you know, guarded by his uh, divine mother, he's taking his wife, uh, his father, and his little boy to safety in the mountains. There's a very poignant moment where Aeneas' mortal father, Anchises, um, he declines to leave his homeland. He says, you know, I'm elderly. If Troy is going to fall, I'm going to fall with it. It's just this very poignant, uh, if you get a chance uh, to read this. Look at what Aeneas says. The dutiful son Aeneas, book 2, line 857. Do you suppose, my father, that I could tear myself away and leave you? Unthinkable. Then come, dear father, arms around my neck. I'll take you on my shoulders. No great weight. Whatever happens, both will face one danger, find one safety. So I really admire Aeneas here. Um, I feel like 
His father Anchises is symbolic of all the weight and responsibility of this divinely ordained mission uh, that Aeneas has to shoulder. And so he is bearing the destiny of his family of Troy on his back. Uh, anyhow, I feel like he is, uh, he's an admirable uh, figure. Uh, moving on, moving on. So uh, Aeneas's wife, Creusa, she was a sister of Hector. She prays to be uh, permitted to die with her husband. Uh, she's holding up their baby boy uh, and for forcing uh, him to think uh, of, uh, of their son uh, as well. So Aeneas is in such a rush. He's in such a, a frantic hurry to flee the city with his family. He unknowingly leaves his wife, Creusa, behind. Uh, very sad. At what point did she get lost? It's not really apparent. Creusa is lost and Aeneas does go back to find her, but it's too late. He's just going to encounter her ghost. Uh, and so Creusa's ghost says that her abandonment would not have occurred without the God's decree. This was fated. This is something that had to have happened for her to have been left behind and perished. Uh, take a look, book two, line 1008. The, the ghost of Creusa tells him, Nothing here has come to pass except as heaven willed. You may not take Creusa with you now. It was not so ordained. So <coughs> her desertion, uh, you know, had to occur uh, for, for the destiny of Rome, really. So it's the will of the gods that she is left behind so that Aeneas can serve a higher purpose. He can find a new home. Aeneas was strategically selected by the gods because uh, he has been a dutiful hero and he will continue to be. Uh, and he's willing to set aside his loved ones, those who are dear to him, precious to him, you know, to follow uh, the divinely ordained mission. Uh, anyhow, um, so compare him, uh, for example, to Homer's Achilles. Vast difference. Uh, something that's very important now as we're coming to a close uh, with this lecture here is, and I have it underlined, that the defeat of Troy, that was something that was meant to be that was meant to be. It was meant to happen. It was fated, and it was even favored by the gods, actually, because uh, if you think about the selfish desire of uh, the Trojan Paris uh, having kidnapped uh, Helen, he stole uh, he Helen, and so um, he took her back to Troy. Troy's leaders allowed this to happen. They permitted this hap to happen, uh, and so um, for him to enjoy his criminal misdeed, uh, Paris, and and so by having Troy destroyed, uh, you know, it's almost as if this taint, tainted sinful past is gone. And so now these surviving Trojans, they're going to be seeking a fresh start uh, and a fresh future in Italy. Uh, and so now they have to find a new home uh, that is free of this tainted past. Uh, and that is acceptable to the gods. So the Trojans will become Italianized, and so uh, they will eventually acquire their Italian identity and nationality. And so now, uh, here, uh, I have Hope with the Shooting Star at the very end. And I feel like, you know, the classics still speak to us today. This sp still speaks to me. I hope to all of us that even in times of sorrow and despair, uh, the worst can possibly turn uh, to the best scenario. So uh, take a look here. Fatherly uh, Aeneas, his son Aeolus, and his father Anchises is three generations. They're witnessing a favorable omen here, three favorable omens. Uh, there's a crown of flames playing about uh, Aeneas' son's head. There's a sound of thunder on the left, and then there's a shooting star. Uh, and so uh, so now um, it's uh, clear this divine fire that's around the sun, uh, the head of the son of Aeneas, uh, that that must connote divine favor, that he is going to be king uh, someday of Rome. And so uh, the gods, in other words, have chosen Aeneas's son to continue Troy uh, elsewhere. Actually, the grandfather, uh, Anchises, uh, realizes what the meaning of this is. So. Uh, anyhow, um, but his wife, Aeneas' wife, had said, uh, Book 2, line 1013, long exile waits and long sea miles to plow. So uh, anyhow, he tries to 
Aeneas tries to embrace his uh, wife's ghost, her spirit. He's not successful in doing so. So much sadness in this poem. My gosh, we haven't even gotten to book four yet. So uh, anyhow, um, Creusa's ghost says that it's the will of the gods that Aeneas will be the founder of a new kingdom in the West. Uh, and so um, uh, moving on here, Creusa, the wife, uh, the spirit tells him he's a bachelor, that he's going to remarry and have a queen. Dido is listening to this the whole time. Dido thinks, yes, she and Aeneas then will be uh, married. And so uh, anyhow, all, uh, all of this fire, serpent imagery, devastation and loss uh, of Troy in book two, it's going to end. Uh, with a quote-unquote morning star uh, connoting optimism uh, and hope, uh, hope for a new day. So uh, book two uh, ends on an optimistic, positive note. Anyhow, uh, I cannot wait until we continue with this uh, book four, the tragic love story. Uh, you know, the famous opera by Henry Purcell, Dido and Aeneas is based uh, you know, uh, on, on this epic poem, uh, and it's, it's a great opera. So, uh, anyhow, um, cannot wait till we get further along. In the meantime, happy reading.